So this is the true story and how it unfolded for the first time for you guys. Okay. Various newspapers all across the world wrote about this whole story. And I think it was more than, it was a patient story. And a lot of the top guys here were laid. All of you guys would have done heavy patience before, but this became more a human angle story. And, and that's how this whole story unfolded. So this is how Iman Ahmed looked uh, when she was born. So she probably had a monogenic cause for her obesity, but nobody could really figure it out and nobody had even discovered it. These were her early childhood pictures. And uh, soon enough, it started like a Facebook campaign and you know how popular social media is in this part of the world. And it started like a Facebook campaign by her sister, Shaima, who actually went out and wrote this kind of a letter to the president of uh, Egypt, President Sisi, wherein she said that her sister was dying, she was 500 kilos, she was dying, and there was nobody ready to help her. And uh, there's, she had gone once to the hospital three years before this letter came to me, and uh, that's the doctor's reports when, he's, uh, when she went and suffered a stroke and complete paralysis of the right side of her body. So on the 23rd of October 2016, soon after the sister wrote about uh, this uh, online campaign, this became news across the world, okay? Almost every, from CNN to BBC to every newspaper in the world carried this story. And these are the pictures. I was not even aware of her presence at that point of time. So this was the first image that was sent to me. This was a true image, nothing morphed, nothing uh, done on this image. And uh, the reason why actually I felt sorry and I took this case on was because I asked the sister why it didn't, I had a lot of friends in Egypt and I said I'd speak to them, why don't you go to these doctors? And she, she told me that most of them had refused. So I said, why didn't you reach out to people across the world? And she said, people refused. So I had to believe her and this is what CNN and called. So this was the first letter that the sister sent me, where she actually, the Arabic translation for obesity surgeries, but before that for 25 years, had not moved at all. And she was being cared for by her sister and her mother and lying in urine and stool whole day. So it took a lot of things for them to move and she would just lie. She could just move her, her neck. She, they fed her from the mouth and the first thing is what we saw is that when they fed her, there was she used to cough out violently because of the stroke. She used to aspirate. So she could not really swallow. And I always keep thinking of Stephen Hawking's words that even if helping one person might change, might not change the whole world, but it's, it will change the entire world for that one person. That's why I took this case on. So the first setback, I didn't even realize she did not have passports. All right. And so I, had, I had, didn't have a Twitter account until that time. And Someone told me that our foreign minister is very, very Twitter happy and she can help you. So I created a Twitter account and I just tweeted her saying, ma'am, they went to the normal passport office uh, in India for the visa, but you need fingerprinting. And the, the official refused because he said that I need the person here. And since this lady had not moved for 25 years from her house, there was no way she could have gone for fingerprinting. So she was refused. Uh, luckily for me, the foreign minister saw this uh, tweet and she, I didn't know at that point of time that she was in hospital herself and she was getting a kidney transplant the next day. But shockingly, she replied, and the next day the visa was granted. And so for the first time in aviation history, we planned to do something. We planned to fly someone who had never got out of a house for 25 years, 5,000 odd kilometers across, and we didn't know what we were dealing with. So we thought of DVT, we thought of various things. And for the first time in my life, I actually went to Alexandria, Egypt to meet uh, with Iman, and that's the first scene I saw, and I, I could understand. She was in a very, very tiny little room, and she had never moved from there, and that was the first pictures with her mother and sister that I got. Then we realized that she had everything from top to bottom, so she had already got a stroke, she had severe core pulmonal, so her uh, uh, RA, uh, PA pressures uh, were as high as 68. She had a potassium of around 6.3, uh, the first time we investigated. She had a PCO2 of 68 and a PO2 of 30. We didn't know what else to uh, do with her. Her legs were completely swollen. This is a picture of her legs. And if you just notice that that is her knee, above the first roll is where her knee is. Because she had crawled for her whole life and she had never walked. This is the first picture of her abdomen. So now you can understand why they could not really clean her. And that's why she used to lie in her urine and stools the whole day, because her abdomen was so pendulous that it just touched the ground, and her legs were completely alleviated outside. And 
I was not a rich surgeon like Valeria is, so I had to collect money to try and get her down. And so then I started looking at where would I get funds from. So we started this fundraising campaign and various other things. I reached out to people from the airline industry who I thought could help me, but they all came out and said that she cannot fly because she's five feet wide, she will not fit in through any commercial airline. Even an air ambulance cannot take her. So for the first time, I realized what the hell had I taken on board. And I again reached out to them and said, why don't you go to the Egyptian surgeons and they might be able to help you. But of course, Ingli, that didn't help. And then we, we worked around and in India, we started a Facebook campaign and people put in as low as like $100 and various things in the account just to collect money for her to come to India. Became quite a rate. So this was, this was the first time the newspaper started reporting stuff like this. And we went on to build a complete uh, new room because she could not fit into any elevator in the hospital. Any new room in the hospital could not fit her because the doors were just limited. Nobody could fit someone who was five feet wide. So these were the room we created. Unfortunately for us, uh, the room was created and we had some problems with the local municipal authorities and they came and broke this room down. So just before she was supposed to come, they came and broke this room down. And this is, by that time it had become a media story, so the media was just running back and forth writing different, different stories. And this was my entire team. So we stayed up for three nights on a row and we cleared the accounts section and we created a room for Iman. In the meanwhile, my entire team of doctors flew there and we were all granted visa by the Council General, luckily. And the entire team flew with 300 kg of medical equipment. So other than the oxygen cylinders, we flew with everything there, from portable ventilators to portable AC, EBG machines to everything that was possible because we knew what we were getting into. And we had to put in a central line inside uh, her own room because she refused to go to a hospital and there was no way we could have found a vein. So my entire team went and ultrasound guided, they put in a central line uh, out over there. These were the first assessment reports, like I told you, very scary reports and we thought we'd lose her. So we had to optimize her. So we waited for 10 days to optimize her. In the meanwhile, back, background channels, we started speaking with the governments, governments got involved and that was uh, the medical director from the hospital who met with the chief medical advisor of President Sisi and they give their consent to fly their national to India. This was the Indian Council General out over there who again helped us a lot out over there. Then for the first time I realized, realized that I knew very little about electronics and, and elect aeronautical engineering. So what we had to do is we had to create a special bed because when you fly, fly a 500 kg object it cannot move around in the plane. So every pillar or every leg of that bed had to take around three times the force. So 1.5 tons of force that leg had to make. So we specially made beds out over there and we started using various techniques to try and fly these people. And that's how it happened. And this was the first time actually that you would see that Iman was moved out of her room. This is how they did it in Egypt, okay? It took 15 men all together, and for the first time in over, over three years when she was moved out, they tried to grab her with a bed sheet on which she was lying. And this image was sent by the sister to me, and it kind of scared me, because I thought she'll get a DVT and she'll completely go, and that'll be the end of the entire story. This was the night before she was shifted out. As you can see, that tiny little room, it's difficult, so people are moving from side to side to try and get her out. This is how they dragged her out of her room. So the, this is the first time I'm showing these videos to people because this is all just cap. And that's how they dragged her from her room into her living room for, from where we would break the window eventually to get her down. There was a lot of arguments even back and forth then where they thought they'll drag her like this through the staircase. And we said that if you all want to do that, then we are out of this whole picture and we would not 
want to be any part of this. So this is the first time they actually, she moved out of her room. And then that is where her house was. So we had to break the entire window in the morning to bring her down. This was around a two-story structure wherein her house was. And then we got cranes. So the, I don't know how many of you have, have heard of the Hormuz statue. So we hired the people who had the Hormuz statue to actually move her down and move her. This is the entire team from Egypt Air and various other teams from Rosco who kind of helped us. So I'll just show you, this was what Arabic news uh, channel covered and probably, I don't know, you all might be able to. I don't know what is written, you all would understand better than I would. It's marketing, they, they are marketing their uh, <laughs> company. <laughs> I don't know, I wanted to put the volume high. And that is how she was got down, actually. That is how she was suspended from her, her, her house and she was got down. Eventually it took probably just less than three minutes. And I do know that my residents, their, their pulse rates were around 150 and Iman's pulse rate was 80. So she was very stable through the whole thing. I don't know how, but she for the first time in 25 years had seen sunlight because she had not been out of her room. So this was the big challenge. And we had to keep this table so we could not twist it on either side. And that's how the news kind of broke out world over. Well, she got down. And, and this is in the truck that was specially designed for her to take her to uh, the, the air. Now, we had to do a side boarding aircraft. So we, we did this entire side boarding aircraft to put her on board. And this is the number of people. There were some 400 people at the air cargo terminal in Bombay. None of them had any job to do. They wanted to see who Iman Ahmed was. Okay. <laughs> That's the Council General of Egypt who was there next to me. And early hours of the morning, she came. So when she was on flight, we could not contact my team. And those were the, the things that I think I must have got so many myocardial infarcts. Because there was a lot of being, things being said. But if she wouldn't have landed off that aircraft, I was responsible. So eventually, she did land. And that is how we moved her to her room through a crane again. That is the council general uh, just soon after she came into the room. And this is the amount of money we had to pay to Egypt to fly her down. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we don't have that much time. Okay, I'll just go through. So the next morning, almost every newspaper from all across the world had on on the headlines of uh, probably every, every damn newspaper had on the headline. And that was her. Okay. Now, this is how we, we actually weighed her at that point of time. When she came, we got this entire contraption to try and weigh her. And if you see this on some part of the video, And that was uh, soon after Iman came in. This is how we used to make her do exercises. Like I said, her right side was completely paralyzed. Her left side could move. So for the first uh, few days, we had, uh, we had a great time because she came and she did, she did well. Uh, and that is, again, So it was all, all, all very good and we were really happy with the way she was going until this thing happened. Very soon, around 15 day, 10 to 15 days after she came, this is the first signs we noticed. If you look at this probably, we started getting twitching in, a, in this hand. And at that point, we, didn't, we could not put her into an, any MRI or CT scan machine to figure out why that stroke had happened. Nobody could figure out. And for, to our dismay, this is 
this is when I had actually slept that night because she went into status epilepticus soon after she came. And that was, that was how she was when we got into, we had to intubate her, the anesthesia team, which was very scared to even intubate her. We had no choice because every drug we used, we didn't know what dose of the drug or what we had to use. Eventually, for three days, we had to completely intubate her and paralyze her to take her out of status epilepticus. And that was the most scary thing that we had faced soon after she came. Well, eventually she did come out of this and we closely monitored her. We made her lose 22,000 liters of fluid. And that is how she lost a lot of the weight. So she lost around 22,000 liters of fluid when we monitored her. And soon we had a, this is just before surgery, when we had a dancing to Arabic music as well. So we, we did get our good times and, and bad times with Iman before she actually, uh, before we actually operated. Eventually we decided to operate on her after she lost around 120 kilos. So after she lost that weight, the day of the surgery, this was her, the entire team. It took us 45 minutes to do the, the entire surgery. And post the surgery, she was doing her physiotherapy. As you can see that she was moving her arms. She had even started moving a lot of her right side arm. And soon enough, she lost. So she started losing weight very fast. Mainly it was fluid control and various other things that we did. But we had to uh, put in the right sheep again because she started aspirating the moment you give her any kind of liquid. Solid she could tolerate, but on liquid she would aspirate. So after she lost and came to around 170 kilos, we could finally put her uh, into a CT scan machine to actually evaluate. And what we realized is that there was that old infarct which had caused all these various things and there was nothing much we could do. Well, this was all good. This was around three months after she came and all the story was great. Until one fine day, to our dismay, we realized the other human side of what things can go wrong. Okay, so long before she came, the, like I said, every newspaper in the world carried her and various other people from across the world who were super heavyweight contacted us. And then I had to actually go on to newspapers to say that I wouldn't be crazy enough to take such a patient on board. And every, this is the health minister, support from the government. We had the foreign minister of Egypt and various ambassadors of Egypt, everybody visiting her. And all was well until I realized for the first time in my life how media can completely, completely take you apart. All right. And they say that the most powerful entity on earth is media. They can make the innocent guilty and the, the guilty innocent. And when we told the sister that now she can go back to Egypt and come back to us a year later when we were thinking in terms of doing probably a sadi later. She, she uh, said that, who's going to look after her? You've got so much publicity. Now keep her here for two years, otherwise I'm not taking her. And we said that we'll keep her here. The ambassador said we'll move her to the Neurological uh, Institute, but nothing came. And that's when the sister released this video, which was a completely doctored video. And to our shock and dismay, this was released. So this entire thing was changed. Uh, I don't know whether you can hear this, but this is, uh, this is all in Arabic. Wherein the sister uh, took these images uh, and we didn't understand why she did it, but uh, only later, because the governments were involved, we, were rea we realized that she had done a deal with another hospital in Abu Dhabi to take her there. And they had kind of almost told her that first, you can't just take you for physiotherapy. So first say that the doctors in India did a bad job and that you've not lost any weight at all. So, so if you realize that she just scanned through this whole thing and she kept saying that this is all a lie and doctors have not done a great job. And I don't want to show you this whole video. I don't know whether you all might have seen this as well. And one fine day, I suddenly, the hospital authorities called me up and said that uh, there's a problem because suddenly the newspapers jumped on this entire story and you had the mother, the sister, all. So if she was made to cry, taken a, a snapshot and they would put it in the papers. And that's how dangerous the media can get. Okay, because at the same time, uh, you would recognize this guy, right? The same day, Samir was chatting with her. Then this story broke out the same day Samir was chatting with her and that was her real, real picture. And that doctored video was being circulated throughout the world. 
So I actually told Samir that I don't know much of Arabic, but can you please speak to her and ask her? So Samir actually spoke to her in Arabic, and she told Samir that, you know, I've been told by my sister to behave like this. And Samir actually did ask her that, would you like to go back to Egypt? And she said, yes, I do want to go back to Egypt. I want to go back to my country. But uh, uh, unfortunately, and as you would know, this is the owners of the other hospital who came and shook hands with her. She was smiling through that. And to our problem, social media, that was the way they said, you've never weighed her. That was the bed on which she was, where we could weigh her on a day-to-day -day basis. So social media, we had people in India, again, who wrote about this. And unfortunately, we had to lose her. I didn't want her to go, but unfortunately, we lost her. So the day when she came was like this, and the day she went back to Abu Dhabi, and on the day she landed in Abu Dhabi, that was her image. So we were shocked that such a, such a sad uh, transformation of the whole thing. Unfortunately, we had made them sign everything, because my Egyptian colleagues told me, make sure you make them sign every bloody damn thing, or something will happen there, and they'll blame you for it. So all the good doctors in Egypt advised me that social media is very powerful in Egypt, please make sure. So we made the hospital authorities sign everything from the last ABG report to the pictures of every single report when she left. I think the patient who came to us when we thought she wouldn't live went home alive, went back to Abu Dhabi alive. And when she was going to live, I thought she died. That was the only sad part. And as a doctor, I can only say this. The only person who wrote about this story was, I think she was undergoing a procedure, maybe a tummy tuck or a liposuction, and she died during that procedure. That was the sad part. And media again jumped on and asked me to comment against uh, the doctors in uh, this thing. And all I did was this. I put this on my Twitter account. I didn't want to speak against anybody. And I thought this was the only way I could say bye-bye to uh, Iman. Because uh, all, this is the last two slides, please. This is the only image that I can only always think of her. She reserved one great smile for me. And she used to dance with all of us on Arabic music. And we used to love her for that. And uh, I think the entire staff in Sefi and everybody will continue to miss her because she became a special part of her lives for three uh, months at least while she stayed with us. And uh, we have not ended. We've not learned our lessons from that. I thought we'd learn our lessons so we'd not take on any challenges. But we've taken on these cases. These are the cases of all the kids who CNN reported. This is a family of uh, four kids, out of which three are obese because of monogenic obesity. These kids are two years, five years, and six years old. And all of them are super obese. They're 50 kilos and 60 kilos overweight. And then we've got this French national who's come to us. Again, CNN, BBC has reported him. He's already been operating in Mayo Clinic, and this is him with us right now. And I was just asking Waleed and Sultan for their advice as to what to do with this guy today. So thank you so much for a patient interesting. Thank you, Dr. Doyan, and I hope to see you Yes. I think uh, I don't need to any comment. Uh, the audience, uh, they give you the answer, uh, Dr. Mufazzal. You have done a great job, but I think the media, it can make right, wrong, wrong, right, black and white, everything. Media is very strong. So really, I, you ask me what to choose, uh, because he has been, been treated fairly, because uh, to take this patient with this effort, uh, and what you have done, and you do your hospital, Safi, and really uh, you have done a great job for humanity to, to take the lead for managing this patient. Uh, and instead of thanking, uh, it was uh, they spoiled your name and they stained your name and disfigured uh, your rights. And uh, really, that's uh, once I know that you are in Saudi Arabia, I spoke, I said, okay, uh, it was my mistake not to invite him, but please, but if he can give a spare time to come to Riyadh, and really to show, uh, to, to prove, uh, to show what he has done. And I'm sure because you are the most humble person I know and I like you. So really everybody uh, is convinced that you have done a great job. Uh, but uh, this is the life. <laughs> uh, but really uh, we are sorry for what been happened to you, but uh, we like you and we trust you all the time and we'll all the time be friends. So don't forget. Yes. 
Dr. Mossad, good afternoon. I'd like uh, to thank you for the great job you did. And as everyone is saying that the media is strong, but I'll tell you, Allah is stronger. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, our